he let the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny, was a lonely hill called Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. If there is a love, the ocean is dry, there's no stars in the sky, and the eagle can fly. If there is a love, then heaven's a myth, there's no feeling like this. If there is a love, even in death he remembered the thief hanging by his side. He spoke with love and compassion, then he took him to paradise. If there is a love, the ocean is dry, there's no stars in the sky, and the eagle can't fly. If there is a love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If there isn't love. <clears throat> I set the boundaries of the ocean vast, carved out the mountains from the distant past, molded a man from the miry clay, breathed in him life, but he went astray. I own the cattle on a thousand hills, I write the music for the whippoorwills, control the planets with their rocks and rills, but give you freedom to use your own will. I hold the waters in my mighty hand, spread out the heavens with a single span, Make all creation tremble at my voice, but my own sons come to me by choice. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills, control the planets with their rocks and rills but give you freedom to use your own will. Even the oxen know the master's stall, and sheep will recognize the shepherd's call. I could demand your love, I own you twice, but only willing love is worth the price. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills. Control the planets with their rocks and rills. But give you freedom to use your own will. And if you want me to, I'll make you whole. I'll only do it though it say so. I'll never force you, for I love you so. I give you freedom, is it yes or no? I give you freedom, is it yes or no? I give you freedom, is it yes or no? Yes or no?
God bless you tonight. Let me invite you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke in chapter number 23. Luke chapter number 23 in your Bible tonight. And I'd like to begin in verse number 50. And, and what a good night to be with God's people. Great song. That's an old school song. I haven't heard that one in a long, long time. And that was a, a good reminder that uh, by whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever is a powerful word, but will is as well. And, and there's the message of the word of God, a choice for humans to make. Uh, my, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, what a great night tonight to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. God bless you tonight. You have your Bible to the book of Luke in chapter number 23. And, and, and of course, the Lord Jesus Christ now has died upon the cross for you and for me. The Bible tells us the even was coming. It was a preparation day, a high day. It, it wasn't yet the Sabbath, that Friday, that would soon come. But, but no, the word of God is very clear that the evening now was approaching. The Lord Jesus dies on a cross at three o'clock. And I, I don't know if we appreciate this enough. I don't know if we realize how desperate things are about to become. You know, we know the story. We've heard it all of our lives. We've read it so many times. But, but the Bible goes out of its way to tell us that if Christ be not risen, then your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. And ye are of all men most miserable. There's a lot of problems in that verse for you and me. If Jesus Christ does not rise from the dead. And being miserable is a real problem, but the bigger problem is you are yet in your sins. And if you and I don't have a risen Savior, you and I have zero hope of eternal life. If Jesus doesn't come out of that sepulcher and he doesn't live again, then you and I will never be saved. There is no hope of going to heaven. There is no victory over death. There is no rescue from hell unless the Lord Jesus Christ walks out of that sepulcher alive. And it almost never happens. Now, I say that, and of course, that's saying it through human eyes and human words and human thinking. If there's one thing that we have certainly learned by now in the story of Calvary is that everything is right on schedule. Everything is always right on time. The goodman of the house was right on time. Simon of Cyrene, he was right on time. Everything about Calvary, not too early, not too late, not a blast of hurry, the song says. God is always right on time, and, and so we shouldn't be surprised now that Jesus has died upon the cross that God is certainly not going to panic. But you know, while we know that God never panics, I, I, I've always wondered, do the angels? You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I know. I know I don't know, and I'm pretty sure you don't know either. And, and if they were ever going to panic, they're going to panic right about now. Because that sun is slowly sinking in the western Israeli sky. And pretty soon that sun is going to sink into the Mediterranean Sea. It'll be 6 o'clock in the middle of April, as we would call it on our, our watches. And, and when that moment comes, the calendar flips into the next day. And when that happens, something is going to take place. You see, when the criminals are hanging upon the cross, those two malefactors, along with the Lord Jesus Christ, normally, as we mentioned yesterday, they would stay there for a long time. On a cross, somebody could literally spend hours, even days, and, and the longer it took, the better the Roman Empire liked it. They wanted as many people as possible to see the horrific suffering and, and the agony, so they could say, you defy us, that is what happens to you. Uh, however, during Passover week, things are different. And when the sun sets, well, the Jewish law says a body cannot be hanging on a tree. They cannot be hanging by the neck. They cannot be hanging upon the cross. And so when that sun settles into the Mediterranean and the calendar flips to the next day, there is no choice to the matter. Why, by them, these bodies have to be disposed of. Their family members need to come and take them down from the cross. And they have to be buried before sunset. If there are no family members. And, and a lot of times you get some malefactors, you get some very bad men hanging upon crosses. Well, family members have long since abandoned them. And so as the sun is setting, well, there was one thing to do. They would take those bodies and bring them to the Valley of Gehenna. 
That was where a fire burned 24 hours a day. The Valley of Gehenna was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And when beggars died and nobody claims their bodies, or when criminals die, such as on a cross, and no one is there to bury them, well, the Roman soldiers would take these bodies down from the cross, and they would bring them to the Valley of Gehenna, and they would toss those bodies into the fires, and their bodies would be cremated. And I don't know if we appreciate what's going on here. Because the afternoon is slowly turning into the evening. And if something doesn't happen to the Lord Jesus hanging upon that cross, he has now died. There is no question that he has died. Why, the Roman soldiers come to the first malefactor, and he wasn't dead yet, so they broke his leg. And when they break his leg, he can no longer push himself up and suck air. Soon he will suffocate. They come to bad man number two, and they break his leg. Soon he is going to die as well. But when they come to Jesus, they marveled that he had died already and they didn't break his leg and little did they realize the very same phonies who hours earlier were saying prophesy prophesy one more time these Roman soldiers fulfill a 1,000 year old prophecy when they do not break the bones of the Lord Jesus Christ but if something doesn't happen they're gonna take his body and throw it into the valley of Gehenna there won't be a sepulcher. There won't be a resurrection. And if Christ be not risen, then you and I will never be saved. You and I will live our lives and spend eternity in the fires of hell. The clock, so to speak, is ticking towards 6 p.m. On the, on the doomsday clock like that one, it would be ticking towards midnight. Time is running out and the hour is late and something has to happen and it's got to happen right now. I mean, it's awfully easy to look around and say, well, where's the family? members. They're the first people responsible. But the book of John tells us neither did his brethren believe on him. They were a long way from Calvary on this day. His mother was there, but his brothers were not there. Why, one of those brothers, James, would one day be born again, but he would not be saved until he sees the risen Savior. There is no James. There is no Joseph. The rest of the uh, brothers of Jesus are absent without leave. They are long gone. Well, then one would certainly expect his disciples to take care of him. Well, John had orders from Jesus, very specific orders. You don't take care of me, you take care of Mary. That would leave, of course, the other 11. One of those had already gone out and hanged himself. That cut it down to 10. One of those was weeping bitterly and that left nine. And those nine had long since run away and fled. They were running for their lives. And the sun is setting and the hour is getting late and there's just a little bit of time left and those soldiers are going to take the body off the cross and they're going to throw the body of Jesus into the fire and if the body of Jesus is cremated and not buried then the Lord Jesus Christ can never save you and he can never save me if they take his body and throw him into the fire, Isaiah 53, 9 tells us that he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. The scriptures will not be fulfilled. Everything comes to a close. If the Lord Jesus Christ is taken by those Roman soldiers and he has tossed him to the fire and instead of die, uh, being buried in a sepulcher, he is burned in the flame, then you and I have absolutely zero chance of going to heaven. And then, what do you know in verse number 50? There's that word again. And behold. I mean, you know, I love that word. That word's a huge word in the Bible. I mean, when everything is falling apart and everything is dark, there's nowhere to turn, there's nowhere to go, the wheels are coming off. When there's nothing to do, when we are hopeless, helpless, and lost, all of a sudden, the Bible throws that word behold, and it's God's way of saying, and you're not going to believe what happens now. It's God's way of saying, fasten your seatbelt, because here we go again. And what do you know, in a moment like this, in the Old Testament, and I think it's called for such a time as this when everything is falling apart there's nowhere to turn there's nowhere to go you can almost feel the angels in a moment of panic everyone is worried everyone is gazing everyone is staring down at that cross because if something doesn't happen and if something doesn't happen right now Bible salvation is finished and what do you know the Bible says, and behold, in verse number 50, there was a man named Joseph.
When Jesus was born, God had a Joseph. And now as Jesus dies, who'd have thought there's another Joseph? And the thing about this Joseph, in John 19, 39, he's called the secret disciple. Father, we pray for your help from the mighty word of God. And you would speak to men, ladies, and young people. If someone has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that tonight they would understand the only hope of their soul is the risen Savior, the Son of God. And for your children, I'm praying that tonight the word of God, Calvary, would stir our souls and stir our hearts that we would never be the same. We are in desperate need of you doing a work a preacher can't do. So we come in the name of the risen Son of God. Jesus our Savior. Amen. We certainly get quite the story of Joseph of Arimathea in the Bible. The Bible tells us that he is from this little village called Arimathea. And nobody's for certain for sure where Arimathea is. The best guess from people that study these things, however, is that Arimathea in the New Testament is the same as Rama in the Old Testament. Now, if that is true, well then, that's a little significant, I guess, because in the Old Testament, Rama gave us a mighty man of God by the name of Samuel. Now in the New Testament, perhaps that same little village gives us this man, Joseph of Arimathea. He was from this place, but by now he has left the little village of Arimathea and Joseph lives in the big capital city of Jerusalem. Now it's been a while now that this businessman moved to Jerusalem and, and established a business. He's done well for himself. He never forgets his roots from that little village of Arimathea, but by now he is Joseph of Jerusalem. In verse number 50, the Bible tells us there was a man named Joseph, a counselor. You know, to us, a counselor is somebody that gives advice and wisdom. But in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, a counselor in the day of our Bible was somebody who simply sat on a council. That was the first definition. And that would describe Joseph. He was sitting on a council that was called the Sanhedrin. And why was that ever a council? In the city of Jerusalem, for a businessman like Joseph, there would be no greater honor than to be elected to the board called the Sanhedrin. It was a mixture of religious people and business people, but you didn't get on the Sanhedrin unless you were well respected and you were well honored. And for somebody who didn't grow up in Jerusalem, for somebody who came from the Podunk village of Arimathea, made your way to Jerusalem and made a name for yourself to be elected to the board of Sanhedrin. Well, let's just say that everybody in Jerusalem has high regard and high respect for this man, Joseph. And you know, he's not the only, he's not only respected by his peers, the Bible tells us he's respected in heaven. In verse number 50, it tells us that he was a good man and a just. That doesn't really impress us too much in America, does it? Because we're ready to call just about everybody a good man. Oh, that guy, he's a good man. Oh, that guy's a good man. If you grow up in certain parts of this country that shall remain nameless, they're called good old boys. But you know, it's the same idea. And we're pretty used to calling just about everybody we like a good man, a good man, a good man. However, the Lord is not so generous with this term in the Bible. There are very few people that are called good men in the Bible. In fact, in the entire book of Luke, there's only one other person that is called good, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. A good man in the Bible is a whole lot gooder, if I could use the word, than it is in our vocabulary. And when the Bible tells us he's a good man, well, Luke chapter 6 and verse number 5, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. A good man in the Bible does good things on the outside because he's got good treasure down here in his heart. The Bible tells us he's a good man. And more than that, the Bible says that he's a just man. He's a righteous man. He's not going to play favorites now. He's not going to treat people differently. You know, for somebody to get to elected to a board like the Sanhedrin, you almost have to wonder, you know, who did you scratch? What did you give? What did you pay? Who did you pay off? Not Joseph. The Bible tells us that on the outside, Joseph is a just
just and upright man. Now, it's powerful, isn't it? You and I would look at him like the Bible does and say, on the outside, he's a good man. But the reason that he is a just and a good man is because he has a good and a just heart. In Luke chapter 8 and verse number 15, they on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. That would be the story of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph is a good man on the inside. He is a just man on the outside. The Bible says he is good and he is just. The Bible tells us that he's a man of the Bible. In verse number 51, who himself also waited for the kingdom of God. There are not a lot of people in the New Testament that God tells us they were waiting for the kingdom of God. Earlier in the book of Luke, there is the story of Simeon. Then there is the story of Anna. And it would be awfully hard to find a man and a woman who had a greater love for the word of God than Simeon and Anna. They were waiting for that little baby. They knew the time had come because they were students of the book of Daniel. Well, it would appear Joseph was much the same. He was a student of the Bible. And any student of the Bible is looking for and waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the first student of the Bible we know of was a guy named Enoch. And he was a preacher who preached the king is coming. He was a preacher that said the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The first preacher in the Bible preaches, I'm looking for the kingdom to come. Why every preacher since has been looking for, waiting for, longing for the day when Jesus comes again. The Bible tells us he's a man of the Bible. He is waiting for the kingdom of God. How about this? In Mark chapter 14, verse number 43, the Bible says Joseph is an honorable man. Then the Bible tells us in verse number 52 of our text that Joseph is a popular man. He is so popular he could go to Pilate, the governor, and he could beg the body of Jesus. That's incredibly unusual. If Pilate would ever meet with a common man, the appointment was always set first thing in the day. I mean, after nine o'clock, you're not meeting with a government official. But this man, Joseph, was so important that he could march right into the office of the governor. He could evidently walk right past his secretary, open up the door and announce himself, and he could get an appointment with Pilate. And he had to be important enough to get an appointment with Pilate. The Bible tells us that he's a very popular man. And if that weren't enough, in verse number 53, we find out that he was an incredibly, and I don't mean a little, I mean an incredibly wealthy man. They laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. If you've ever gone to the city of Jerusalem and stood on the Mount of Olives, you can't help but look across the Kidron Valley towards the city of Jerusalem and notice a cemetery. Why the Jewish people to have a plot of land, a burial plot, and have it somewhere near the city of Jerusalem. It is incredibly important, and it is incredibly costly. But even more, if you have a sepulcher, a grave, that is hewn out of the stone, I mean, the cost here is enormous. To have such a place, to have the money to do it, why, Joseph evidently wasn't just a popular businessman. He was a very successful one. So when you look at the story of Joseph, you get quite the biography in the Bible. Joseph is a good man. Joseph is a just man. Joseph is a Bible man. Joseph is an honorable man. Joseph is a popular man. And Joseph is a rich man. I got to tell you, he checks a lot of boxes off here. He's a great guy. But he's also got this one more thing. He's a secret disciple. You know, you just wonder what the whole story is, don't you? How many times Joseph said, I love Jesus and I want to testify of Jesus. He just couldn't do it. I mean, we don't even know for sure when the Savior captured his heart. I, perhaps Joseph was one of those Sanhedrin that was dispatched to go and spy on Jesus Christ. Maybe he was one of those guys with a clipboard to catch him at his words. I, perhaps he was one that was just waiting for one of these statements where they could criticize and they could take it out of context. And, and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the religious 
this establishment were awfully good at that and, and may be dispatched to find fault with him, he heard Jesus preach. And when the gracious words came out of the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ, and instead of those words going into the heart of a bitter, angry man and causing that man to be bold and hardened against God, for Joseph, they tendered his heart. Maybe Joseph watched his miracles. He watched his compassion. I Maybe Joseph was there on multiple occasions, but somewhere along the way, the grace of God captured the heart of Joseph of Arimathea. Somewhere along the way, with all of his companions and all of his buddies and everybody else on the board, with all of them opposed to Jesus, standing against Jesus, criticizing Jesus and condemning him, somewhere along the way, the grace of God captures the heart of Joseph. And Joseph says, I, I love him. I believe on him. I believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe that he is the Messiah promised of God for a Jewish person to be saved in the first century. They would have to confess that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, the son of God, that he is the lamb of God that has come to take my sins away. And somewhere along the way, by the grace of God grabbed his attention. The love of Jesus Christ impressed his life. And Joseph of Arimathea believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But he just couldn't tell anybody. Too much to lose now. Hey, you know, Joseph, a, a very successful businessman, the Bible says, if you were to confess Christ publicly, first thing, you get thrown right out of the synagogue. You know, we kind of have an American attitude, right? Toughen up, buddy, get thrown out of the synagogue. Uh, not so fast. You get thrown out of the synagogue, your family denies you. You get thrown out of the synagogue, you lose every friend you have. A man like Joseph would spend a lifetime trying to earn favor and get on the Sanhedrin. You confess Christ, you are instantly off the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Uh, you confess Christ, you just lose your business opportunities. No one wants to be seen with you. Nobody wants to deal with you. Uh, I mean, for Joseph, you are talking about a ticket to trouble. Should he ever confess the Lord Jesus Christ? He just couldn't do it. How many times do you think he must have gathered in the Sanhedrin? And, and you kind of get the idea, probably accurately, that agenda item number one on every meeting of the Sanhedrin was the Jesus problem. And you know, with the religious establishment composing part of that Sanhedrin, and with the dirty, wicked, pagan high priest himself running the show, uh, you can be certain that every single meeting, they were attacking, they were assaulting, they were mocking, they were criticizing the beautiful lamb of God. And how many times you think Joseph hears those words and, and those words just rip his heart to shreds and Joseph shakes and Joseph says, I can't take this. I, I love him. He saved me. Somebody needs to stand up for him and somebody needs to defend him. And, and I wonder if it isn't like a waterfall just ready to pour out and, and, and like a Niagara that stopped. Joseph is just ready to burst and Joseph is just ready to scream and Joseph is ready to honor him and exalt him and say he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And every time those words are about ready to gush out, old Joseph stops and he thinks, but I just can't. It's just going to cost me too much. And so in John 19, 38, he's a secret disciple. Oh, he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was already taken care of. But he's got this secret. I can't afford to confess him. In verse number 51, the Bible tells us there comes a moment in time. And, and you know, the Bible doesn't actually describe this moment. It tells us that it happens. It doesn't say how. And, and that's one of those videos I guess we're waiting for on the other side. I'd love to see this. Because the Bible says the same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. No, it's the only time this very special word had not consented is found in the New Testament. So there comes a time, and, and, and I love the words, the words in the Bible that God just reserves for one occasion. I, I don't know, I just love the words of the Bible. I study them all the time. I'm fascinated by them. And, and there are words in the language of the Bible that are used but one time. In fact, the, the professors have special words for these words. I'm not even sure what they are, but I sure like those words because it's almost like the God of the Bible, the words of God. He says, we're going to reserve one word and we're just going to keep it back for a very special moment in the Bible. 
And if you want a special moment in the Word of God, well, verse number 51 would be that. The same had not consented to the counsel and the deed of them. I, one day Joseph said, I just can't do this anymore. One day Joseph says, I just can't put up with this anymore. And perhaps it was the whole story of Calvary that grabbed his heart. And Joseph watches as the religious establishment mocks him and laughs at him. And they beat him. And they tear his back to shreds. Uh, they watch as these hypercritics attack every word that flows from his gracious mouth. And, and there comes a time in verse number 51 where Joseph says enough is enough. I wonder if they didn't have one of their emergency meetings and Joseph stood up in the middle of them all, folds his arm and says, boys, I'm going with him. And he walked right out the door. You know, it must have been like it was for old Billy Sunday, the ball player for the Chicago White Sox many decades ago. I, after the ball games, of course, in the day, they only played day games. Billy Sunday and the rest of his teammates would go to downtown Chicago and they would find their bars and their taverns and their nightlife and they would just party night after night night, drink the drink of the drunkards, and, and one day as they were walking the streets of Chicago, there was a preacher on the street preaching the Word of God, and the ball players already half drunk started laughing and mocking and pointing at them, and, and Billy Sunday listened to that preacher, and God was working in his heart, and, and one day Billy Sunday just looked at his ball playing buddies and says, I'm going with Jesus. He turned his back on his buddies and walked across the street, and no longer would he consent to the drinking of those guys. No longer would he consent to their blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. One day he said, enough of this, I'm going with Jesus. And that's verse number 51. Maybe he walks out of one of their meetings. Maybe he never even bothered to show up. But one day Joseph said, enough is enough is enough is enough. It is time for me to be a secret no more. And Joseph takes his stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is it that took a secret man and turned him into a bold man? What is it that took Joseph with all this bursting in his soul and he just can't afford to say anything? What brings Joseph to the place where I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold? And if it costs me my business, and if it costs me my fame, and if it costs me my friends, and if it costs me my honor, if it costs me absolutely everything, I'm going to stand up for Jesus no matter the cost. You know what made the difference for Joseph? Calvary. That's what made the difference for Peter. It's what makes the difference for a thief on the cross. And it's what makes the difference for Joseph of Arimathea. There's Jesus hanging upon that cross, dying for Joseph's sins. There is Joseph on the inside wanting to confess him. On the outside too afraid of what everybody thinks. On the inside loving Christ. On the outside ashamed of the gospel. And yet one day when he is confronted with Calvary, like everybody in these stories, Calvary is either going to draw you in or Calvary is going to show of you away. If somebody is trying to work their way to heaven, Calvary is so offensive to them because Calvary says, this is how ugly your sins are. This is how brutal your wickedness is. The only hope for a sinner is the shed blood of Jesus Christ and someone who is in their religion trying to work their way to heaven is highly offended by the cross of Calvary. But for those of us who are saved, all we can do is just come to Calvary and shed a tear and say, he died for me. And all Calvary does is just draw us into the love, to the amazing love of Christ. How can it be that God would die for me? Calvary is either going to shove a man away or Calvary is going to bring a man in. For one Roman centurion, it draws him in. The rest are pushed away. For one thief on the cross, Calvary draws him in. For the other, it just shoves him away. For most of the religious establishment. Calvary is repulsive to them. But for one Joseph of Arimathea, he looks at that cross and says, I can be a secret no more. And so the Bible tells us it's time to take a stand for Joseph that stand is, I will go to Jesus. And the Bible tells us that he begged the body of Jesus. In Mark 15, 43, it says that he went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. What a difference. He woke up that morning with a man with a secret. He woke up that morning a man ashamed to say a word. He woke up that morning so afraid, I'm going to lose my power, I'm going to lose my money, I'm going to lose my prestige. I can't tell my workmates I'm saved. I can't tell my neighbors I'm saved. 
pay, too much to lose, too much to cost. And a man that was spiritually cowardly turns into a man as bold as a lion. And it's not just boldness. He has boldness to go to the office of the governor. And it's not just that he went in, he went in boldly. He's not going to get by in a timid way now. The body of Jesus is hanging on that cross. If that son goes into the Mediterranean Sea, they're going to take his body and they're going to throw it into the garbage dump. Joseph of Arimathea says, this cannot be. So no matter what anybody thinks, no matter what anybody says, if he can die on that cross for me, then I can risk my fame and fortune for him. And the Bible tells us the bold man marches into the office of Pilate and begs the body of Jesus. During the Boxer Rebellion in China, the boxer soldiers were so brutal and so anti-God and so vicious. Uh, they escaped some of the scorn of history, but they never should. On one such occasion, they went into a Christian school with their 100 students in that school. They marched in with their weapons and their guns, and they grabbed the cross that was hanging on the wall, and, and they placed it by the door that led outside of that building. Then they went to these young students in the school and said, one by one, you're going to march out the building. And they said, if you will step on that cross and grind it into the dirt, we're going to let you keep on going. But if you do not drive that cross into the dirt, we're going to kill you. A young man was the first to walk out and he saw that cross, he saw the weapons and he stepped on the cross as he kept going. The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, six students walk out of that building and they trample that cross into the dirt and they keep on going. Their lives are saved. But the seventh was a young girl and she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She walked up to that cross and saw the soldiers, the vicious soldiers with their weapons. And, and now with the tears running down her face, she knelt down. And instead of stomping that cross into the dirt, she carefully wiped the dirt away. Then instead of stepping on the cross, she carefully walked around that cross. And those wicked men raised their weapons and they killed her on the spot. Ninety-three more young people walk out of the building that day, and every one of them follow the steps of that young lady. And they walk around the cross, and every one of them face their own death. Every one of them pays the price with their own blood, because they would rather die than deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it's like for this man, Joseph. That morning, he begins the day with a secret. I can't afford to. I can't say anything. I can't testify of him. Maybe like somebody in this place, you move to this part of the world, and you got saved and you got family and friends in some other state in some other city and you just can't afford to tell them about Christ. Maybe somebody if I stand up for Jesus on the job they're going to laugh at me. If I go to school and live for Christ they're going to make fun of me and there's a lot of reasons the old wicked one gives us why we can't stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and like Joseph I ought to, like Joseph I want to, like Joseph I need to like Joseph I should but something inside just silences everything and I can't take my stand for him. And then one day Joseph looks at Calvary. When he sees what Jesus did for him, he said, it doesn't matter now. Somebody needs to go and beg his body. Somebody needs to make sure that Jesus is given an honorable burial. You know, I don't know how much Joseph understands. And I don't know if he thought like I imagine the angels are in a state of panic. And I'm not sure Joseph could put it all together and realize the importance, the biblical importance of Jesus being buried that afternoon. But what I do know is that Joseph realized this is going to cost me respect and honor. This is going to cost me my position. This is going to cost me my friends. This is going to cost me my family. But I cannot idly stand by with Jesus on that cross. And so now, this man marches into the office of Pilate and begs the body of Jesus. Of course, Pilate is stunned that Jesus is already dead. Pilate knows the law. He knows that no body can remain on the cross during this week of Passover. It's a high week, a holy week. Those bodies have to come down by 6 o'clock. Pilate understands what this is all about. And, and so Pilate knows how important it is that they are dead and they are buried. And yet Pilate is stunned that Jesus has died. I wonder if Joseph, if Joseph ever thought how important his testimony would be. 
In, in the mouth of two, or in a big case, three witnesses, every word shall be established. That's the Bible standard. I, I don't think you could ever have a bigger case than Calvary. I, I don't suppose that Joseph ever began to think that in 2,000 years, there's going to be liberal cemetery prof uh, seminary professors that are going to say Jesus never died on the cross, that he just swooned, that, that he was just unconscious. approach Joseph's mind. But do you know what Joseph becomes? He becomes one of three witnesses. There is Pilate, there is the Roman soldiers, and there's Joseph of Arimathea. No, no, when your favorite liberal cemetery professor tries to tell you that Jesus wasn't dead, Joseph says, I beg to differ. Pilate has another story. The Roman soldier that took a spear and rams it under his ribcage up into his heart, he's got something else to say. I don't know that Joseph ever began to think how important his testimony was going to be, but Joseph said, no matter what it takes, I look at Calvary and I have to to stand up for him, I can be a secret no more. So after he gets word from Pilate in verse number 53, it says that he took it, the body of Jesus, he took it down. And you read that and I read that and it seems almost such like such casual language in the Bible. But what we might miss with our American eyes is that on the holiest week of the year, on the Passover week for a Jewish man, on the number one most special week of their entire year, Joseph has just made himself unclean. The moment he touches the dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the law, Joseph has become an unclean man. You live if you're Jewish for this one week of the year. It is the most special time, the most holy of times. And now Joseph has made himself unclean. If that weren't enough, the Bible says that he wrapped it in linen. Excuse me. Excuse me. It, it says he wrapped it in linen. The word shroud is never found in the Bible. He said, what about the shroud? It's not in the Bible and it's not Jesus's. The Bible says that he was wrapped in linen. They would put the linen around the body and then they would cut it in strips and put it around each finger and around the foot and the toes. The Bible says that he wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone. And notice where him never man before was laid. The law said that if a criminal is placed into a tomb, never again will a body be laid in this place. And one more time, we look at this with our American eyes and say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? This guy, Joseph, who wouldn't confess Jesus because it would cost him too much, has just paid a tremendous sacrifice. That tomb that he had hewn out of stone, incredibly costly, that tomb that was right outside the city gates of Jerusalem, it was his family tomb. I mean, the intent was that Joseph would rest there, his wife would rest there, his children would rest there. You are talking about an honorable thing. You are talking about a family heirloom. I mean, to us it might seem a little morbid and a little macabre, but in Bible times in the city of Jerusalem, there is no greater possession that this wealthy man's family has than that tomb and that tomb is supposed to be Joseph's tomb he's supposed to go there his wife is supposed to go there but on this day Joseph is going to give it to Jesus you know the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world and there's poverty everywhere he looked I mean one day he even said foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests the son of man hath not where to lay his head I mean, it was so bad that he had to get a, 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 he was laid in a borrowed manger. He cruised the lake on a borrowed boat. He rode into the city on a borrowed beast. And, and everywhere you look, he is hanging upon a cross, the most brutal way to die. And he's dying between two criminals. Everything about the life of Jesus was poverty, except for this. You know, some crusty old fishermen from the city of Bethsaida on the shores of Galilee, number one, they don't have enough gravitas to march into the office of the governor and get it done. And number two, they don't have the money, and even if they did, they wouldn't know how to give Jesus a burial fit for a king. Everything about Jesus' life said pauper, but the word of God had given a prophecy that one day in Isaiah, he will be laid in that sepulcher. He will die, will be buried with the rich. And that's precisely what happens as unlikely as it seemed earlier that day. Joseph of Arimathea is a secret no more. Well, in verse number 54, the Bible gives us a sense of what this was like.
That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. As Jonah, the Bible says, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And it has come to this moment in time. Somebody's got to take their stand. Somebody's got to see that that body is put into a sepulcher. Somebody's got to get the job done. And when there is no Peter and there is no James and John's dispatched elsewhere, when Thomas and Nathaniel and Levi and Simon and the rest of those disciples are long gone, when there is no family member, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a secret disciple gazes upon Calvary and says, I can be a secret no more. And Joseph of Arimathea, as time is running out, saves the day. What a story. And if that were the end of the story, that would be an amazing story. But it was old Mr. Harvey that used to talk about the rest of the story. And sure enough, this has got the rest of the story in it. In John 19 and 39, the Bible tells us, and again, we don't know how this exactly plays out, but when Joseph of Arimathea, a verse earlier called the secret disciple, says it is time for me to stand up for Jesus, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The Bible tells us there came also Nicodemus, which first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrhs and aloes and a hundred pound weight, a, a stunning amount, a, a, enough aloe and weight and perfumes for a king. I mean, when Joseph of Arimathea stands up and says, it may cost me everything, but I am ashamed of him no more. I am standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. All of a sudden in the back of the room, there's another member of the Sanhedrin who says, wait a minute, Joseph, I'm with you. And I got to tell you, if people were stunned when Mr. Rich Man, Joseph of Arimathea, put it on the altar for Christ, their hearts stopped when that guy stood up. Because that guy was the Reverend Dr. Theologian, Dr. Nicodemus himself. You know, he's the one that came out of the city late at night, making sure nobody could see him. And he goes to Jesus and he does what the theologians do. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. You know, what's the, what is it with these guys? How come you can't say, hello, how are you, like everybody else? What is that? And, and Jesus is not impressed with flowery titles and fancy uh, dignities. He looks at him. He said, buddy, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And by the time you make your way through the story, Reverend Doctor, the theologian, scholarly Dr. Nicodemus, he is so befuddled, he doesn't know what's coming. And Jesus said, you're the master teacher and you don't know these things? In fact, it got so bad, Jesus has to give him John 3.16. The verse we give to the boys and girls in the little class, Jesus gives it to the number one theologian. And it really is an amazing story. And all of a sudden, you come to the end of John 3 and you, whoa, 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 time out here. Whatever happens. And this is a lot. It happens a lot in the Bible. You know, whatever happens to this guy, whatever happens to this lady. The next thing you know, Jesus is talking to a lady by a well in Sychar. And you want to scream at the Bible, wait a minute, wait a minute, we missed the last chapter. Whatever happened to Nicodemus? And we would never know if it wasn't for old Joseph. But when Joseph said, I'm with him, Nicodemus said, and I'm with him too. And one of the great stories of the Bible gets its last chapter. Nicodemus joins Joseph of Arimathea, and Calvary changes two men. What a story. Why, one man named Joseph of Arimathea said, no matter the cost, no matter the price, I'm going to put it on the line for him. And I know we don't think much of Joseph. We don't have any songs I don't think about Joseph. We don't talk about Joseph. We rarely preach about Joseph. But while we may not be impressed with him, Heaven is. And you know why I say that? Because in the Bible, repetition is God's method of emphasis. So if you see something one time in the Bible, that's the Word of God. That, that's it. That's, that, it is so. But you know, in the Bible, when you're writing, you can't make something bold. You can't underline it. There are a lot of things you can't do. So when God repeats something, a repeated thing is an incredible point of emphasis. That is God saying, this is doubly important. And if God puts something in the Bible three times, that is the ultimate intense emphasis. The jo story of Joseph of Arimathea is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we say, oh, that's nice. No, that's not just nice. That's incredibly important. The Christmas story is only found twice. 
In fact, the only things that are found in the Bible four times are, are a few of Calvary's events. Jesus entering into the city, the disciples boasting they will not deny him, Jesus exposing Judas, the Garden of Gethsemane in the cup, Peter's denial, the story of Calvary, and the empty sepulcher. Those stories are found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's only two more. Only two more. The feeding of the 5,000 and Joseph of Arimathea. I got to tell you, we may not think too much of him. We respect him perhaps, but the Bible treats him a whole lot more highly than we may have been led to believe. This man is a hero in heaven, and why wouldn't he be? The sun is setting in the western sky, and unless somebody stands up for Jesus and somebody stands up right now, you know, I almost hear the angels putting out an all-points bulletin. Where's Peter, man? See if Peter's, he's, he's not an emotional wreck. You know, where are those disciples? Who's going to do this? I mean, you can almost say a lady can't do this against the rules. I mean, you can just imagine what heaven sounds like. And if the angels are in a panic, well, I know the God of heaven is not. Because one more time, things are right on time. And all of a sudden, when you would least suspect it, lo and behold, here comes Joseph. The man started the day with a big secret, but right now, the secret is gone. Joseph's made his stand. Is there somebody tonight? It is time for you to say, I need to follow the Lord and believer's baptism and let my friends and family know that I'm not ashamed of Jesus, that I am saved. Is there somebody tonight, you've got some relatives perhaps in another city, and it's time for you to let them know you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. Is there somebody tonight, it's time to go to school, it's time to go to the job, it is time to be bold for Jesus Christ and say, if he can die for me, then I can live for him. Is there somebody tonight who says, if Jesus could give his life for me because of Calvary, I can pay a price for him. And tonight, if you don't know him as your Savior, the story of Calvary is that though he was rich, Jesus left heaven and died for you and me. Though he was rich, the Bible says he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. You and I can have the richness of the forgiveness of sins, the richness of a home in heaven, the richness of eternal life, because though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor. So poor he died on a cross for you and me. Buried in the ground, he rose again. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. This church cannot take your sins away. This pastor cannot absolve you of your sins. There is no waters of baptism that can regenerate you and give you eternal life. The only hope for you is the blood of Jesus Christ shed on that cross. He died for you, was buried for you, he rose again. And the Bible says, if thou shalt confess Confess with thy mouth, O Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. If you don't know Christ, we'd love to open the Bible tonight and help you see right from God's word how a sinner like me can know they have eternal life. You know him as your Savior. Well, one day, Joseph of Arimathea thought he had too much to lose until he went to Calvary. And when Joseph saw Calvary, no price is too great. Is there a secret tonight, a secret disciple tonight that needs to say a secret no more? Father in heaven, I'm so grateful and thankful 